Welcome again to the Scandinavian Herland Report, uh, sociologist and uh, journalist uh, Lars Jorgensen. You are from Denmark and you've done some remarkable research and work on uh, the degree of propaganda that we're subjugated to in our Western media today. I would argue that we're losing our freedoms completely in the West and we are living under an illiberal authoritarianism to such a degree that uh, it reminds us defi definitely about the situation in the 1930s in Germany. And we've spoken about the media editors and how they comply with the situation. They have to know what's going on, but choose silence, just like the German media chose silence in the 1930s. But you've also spoken about the intellectuals or the academia. What is the situation there in the West today? Yeah, it's it's really remarkable because you know um, in the 30s we had uh, what what were called in the, in some books the practical uh, imagination. And that means that the academics were very practical thinking, serving the power, uh, and and this is the exact same situation we have today. And uh, if you look, for instance, at the the, the war in Libya, uh, I mean. Perhaps uh, you could you could excuse uh, a lot of people in the academic world for not understanding what was going on back then. Uh, I mean, the, not many know that uh, what happened in Yugoslavia was uh, 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 orchestrated uh, destruction of uh, of uh, Yugoslavia as a nation. So so probably they had no suspicion when we, when we went into Libya. Iraq was very uh, clear case afterwards, uh, and people protested. So, okay, that's sort of settled. But Libya, I don't think people really knew, knew what happened, perhaps. And and again, it was so massive, and all the media, all the politicians said the same thing: um, Gaddafi uh, killing his own people, uh, etc. Uh, so, uh, okay, but the same people who lied about Libya, the same people who who, who argued, uh, the same public relations firms who argued that we should have a no-fly zone in Libya uh, with distrust, disastrous results, right? Uh, failed state, uh, the best uh, nation in Africa, most welfare for the people. People should really go and read about it, uh, the true story of Libya. And destroyed uh, on, on uh, breaking international law, uh, uh, all based on propaganda. The English Parliament made a report last year saying yes, it was all false. So, okay, I don't understand how the academics today cannot be suspicious of what is happening in, in Syria. And they are not. They are, they are buying the same people's arguments, the very exact same public relations firms arguing for a no-fly zone in, in Syria. And not only will, would a no-fly zone in Syria mean that Al-Qaeda and Nusra, ISIS, ISIS would have, uh, have all the opportunity to win. It's, it's, it's a total, a total uh, way of, of removing the, 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 the most powerful weapons they have, the Russian uh, planes and, and, and the Syrian army. So this is a, a complete support for Al-Qaeda. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, but a, a no-fly zone in Syria, uh, you know, the... Uh, the, the chief of the joint uh, military staff in in America said, uh, just primary to the uh, the American presidential election, that if uh, we had a no-fly zone in Syria, that w would mean undoubtedly war with Russia, and and still Hillary Clinton knew this, and a week before the election she said, if I'm elected, we will have a no-fly zone. So she, I mean, the cynicism and the the, the recklessness uh, these Democrats are going to... Yes, we should talk about the academics. Uh, yeah. No, but in the Middle East, uh, because I was there when she did not win the election, people were having big parties and they cooked lamb and all the best stuff cheering because since she was not elected, there would not be a World War III right now. 
people were preparing to remove to to move back to Europe. A number of those who lived in the area which I was in, saying that we better get our you know suitcases out because if Hillary Clinton, the worst warmonger and the most rotten politician ever in recent history, that's how many felt if she's elected will have a new Libya in Syria and World War III will break out. Yes, yeah, I, I share that an analysis. Uh, I mean, the risk was there definitely. And, and again, if you come back to the fake news in the media, uh, almost no, I haven't seen it anyway, uh, Western media reported what, uh, you know, how corrupt Hillary Clinton actually has been. Mm -hmm. they, they, they just, you know, uh, uh, don't report about it. So I, I strongly suggest that people go in, you know, find YouTube videos and see some of the hearings, some of the, the, the hearings where, where she had to, you know, uh, speak under oath and you had the FBI, FBI Comey director and others, you know, stating, uh, Hillary says again and again uh, on, on the television afterwards uh, in the media, no, uh, I didn't lie, yes, and, you know, very, very cynical, very great act, acting. Uh, but if you go in and listen to what the uh, FBI people said, she was lying so much and and she had you know really uh risked uh with all her emails uh she had she said she had only one account she had five or six commissaries and she lied constantly and it was never reported in the media and this is the same we have both of the politicians you know from the extreme middle we could say uh Obama, uh, he's in Bush too, you could say, uh, and, 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 and Hillary and Bill Clinton, of course, as, as they say, uh, Bill Clinton did, did better for right-wing politi politics than uh, Reagan did. Uh, so, so, and, and people don't realize this because it's not reported. But, but, but it's strange too, pertaining uh, uh, to the case of Libya, which I have studied quite extensively, and I was one of the very few uh, in the aftermath of the 2011 that, that wrote about this in, in the leading newspapers in Norway, um, saying that NATO has gone from being a, a, tra a transatlantic defense organization to an international attack organization, uh, you know, serving American interests all over the globe. And, 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 and the dire situation in Libya. And after all, ever since 2007, 2008, uh, the CIA started moving their people into the right positions in Libya. And Libya had opened up their economy. They had finished off the situation with the Lockerbie scandal. They had opened up towards the West. They had removed their uh, military, much of their military arsenal. They were uh, open about their economy and they wanted foreign investment. And all these things had gone on under Saif al-Islam, especially uh, Gaddafi. Gaddafi, Gaddafi's son had, had been so liberal to open up the country. So, and once they were completely opened up, that's when the bombs started coming in. And Libya was among the few nations in the world that was not connected to the IMF or the World Bank. Same, by the way, goes for Iraq before under Saddam Hussein or before, you know, his early days before the war, same goes for Syria, which is a free and independent state with no uh, connection to the IMF. So, and considering also how uh, Libya and, and Muammar Gaddafi was, was, was in, in the process of implementing uh, the gold dinar and unifying the African states to move away from using the dollar as the currency. I mean, th th there are so many things with Libya when you start to speak about that, people know nothing about it. Mm. There was not one word about it in the leading media. Yeah, it's true. And, and uh, I mean, the reason that these nations ha had to be targeted, uh, you know, there are two ways the, what you could call the, uh, the Western Empire, yeah, especially perhaps France, UK, uh, Germany and, and uh, America, of course, uh, work. Uh, they have uh, the, the uh, economic warfare, you know, there was this very important book, uh, Economic Hitman by John Perkins, uh, explaining that, you know, yeah, we, we, we let IMF in, let the World Bank in, let them have big loans and um, suddenly, oh, they can't pay them back. Okay, we'll have to, you know, uh, take resources instead. And then 
they 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 have control of the resources. Uh, the, the countries that do not accept IMF and the World Bank, okay, um, we can't use economic warfare. We'll have to go in physically, and that that's what they've been doing. And and people uh, people don't recognize the pattern again because it's it's too it's too crazy, too cruel, too evil to believe that uh, corporate powers in the West actually go for African nations to destroy them, uh, steal their resources. Uh, so first they come with the good intentions and most people and the media run with it. Uh, yeah, we have to help them, we have to liberate them, we have to give them democracy, we have to get help them get rid of the, the evil man. Uh, but it's very systematically. They only go after the evil man if, if he is not cooperating with the American. Otherwise, they support him. So this pattern is, is hidden by, for people because they, uh, they don't want to face the, 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 the cruel truth about what kind of world we live in. It's systematically done again and again. And every time the politicians uh, uh, and whatever get away with it, saying it's, it was a mistake. And you have uh, to come back to the academics. Uh, they buy it as well. Nobody tells the really tough truth that could make people realize what is happening. So every time you see uh, uh, this this uh, policy they are, they are they are doing again, it failed, right? I, I, perhaps it's like you know the academics uh, commenting uh, on this stuff uh, can can have a position for themselves as the brighter ones because they fail. I know better. It's like it, but they are preserving instead of saying listen. Uh, we know that the CIA and the MI6 destroyed the Middle East the whole, up through the whole 20th century, uh, but especially perhaps after uh, 1970. Uh, the, you know, supported, armed, uh, trained the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, go back and see how uh, the, uh, Egypt was, how Afghanistan was. People will lose their the jaw will drop because they cannot believe that it was like that. And they say, oh, the Muslims cannot, you know, like the Africans, they cannot uh, figure it out. No, they are being helped to be de destabilized. And they were rich countries, these uh, countries like Libya, we know, was a welfare state, uh, a rich Africa, Africa's richest uh, country, uh, second uh, Egypt, and, and then Syria. It was a very highly, you know, high living standard in the in those nations, and and also Iraq before the war, Iraq-Iran war, uh, which was the entry point of the IMF into Iraq, for example. Yeah. But it, it's, it's 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 actually funny because this is, I think, this is a, a key point in understanding what we don't understand because uh, people have this idea that the the poor countries in Africa need yes. help, but I mean. What kind of idea do they have about the economy? What is an, a great economy? They, they have this idea that dollars is, is a very valuable money uh, issue, right? Uh, but it's not the dollars that makes value, right? So please explain how can Saudi Arabia be such a rich country? This is only one very, very easy re reason, right? Oil. Yes. Yes. So if African nations have lots of resources, right? How can you say that they are poor? It is because they are not allowed to have the control of their resources. This is really key to understanding what is happening, both in Africa, in the Middle East, and what, what is happening every time the IMF and the World Bank will help, like we will bring democracy, right? It's, uh, it's Orwellian, uh, a new world, and, and just, just to, to finish this one, I, I mean, this, um, I've mentioned Doc Valentine's work on the CIA. It's incredible important, mm -hmm. really, really important. Uh, and it, people need to take it. Very, it's very, very fine academic wo uh, work, right? But there's another American I would also mention. Uh, his name is uh, uh, Mark Crispin Miller. He has researched American politics and media propaganda for 40 years. And uh, he, he held a speech uh, presentation last year, I think it was, where he said that uh, the situation we have today uh, with the Western media is very similar to the way uh, the, the, the German Nazi uh, media worked in the, in, the, in, the 30, in the 40s. He said all Germans were absolutely convinced that Poland was a very aggressive state against Germany. The rest of the world knew it wasn't so. But the media simply controlled 
the mind of the German population. And this, this, uh, so they they attacked Poland because they had this idea had they had got into people's head that uh, Poland was aggressive. We have the same today. It's just it's just not Germany. It's the, the Europe and America. The media control people's mind, and I know this sounds terrible, conspiratorial, but. Uh, it, it is like that, and that's why I say go back and read something about Libya history, what happened actually in Yugoslavia. Uh, there are plenty of literature about it. And, and, and it's uh, true that we do have a number of uh, academics who, and, and intellectuals who do write about it, and first and, first and foremost maybe uh, a renowned linguist Noam Chomsky has some excellent work and he's been following a number of issues ever since um, the, the time of the Nicaragua and the issues that happened in South America. From that time, I think he started, and, and, and also he's been following, for example, closely, obviously, um, Yugoslavia issues and, and a number of others. And, and in Norway, for example, once uh, we had the Arab Spring, we have had uh, uh, Professor Uni Vikan, she's an anthropologist, uh, who's done extensive research on and lived really for years in Egypt, for example. And once the Tahrir Square um, incident started happening, she instantly wrote in the leading newspapers, beware, beware of what you are doing in, in Egypt and what we are supporting, because the leading newspaper, Often Posten, for example, they instantly put, the, I mean, I, I can never forget, it was really just, it was, and yeah, I, it was just the whole front page, one picture of a little boy doing the V sign, sitting on his father's um, shoulders, and they were all so happy at the Tahrir Square because now freedom was coming to Egypt. And she wrote against that and said, beware, are you aware of what uh, Hosni Mubarak represents? What kind of trends? Are you aware of which trends you're supporting when you support the Muslim Brotherhood? My goodness, she was persecuted for that. She, they, she explained later they drove after her. You know, when she went from the university and back to her house and the mo next morning coming back to the university, there was a car there waiting, following her all the way and they came up to her and told her, we're watching you, all sorts of things. And she even explained later that before I used to say to my students, uh, please, you know, I mean, pose critical questions, you know, because this is like a live type of thing we need to examine all kinds. Today I tell them, please do not pose critical questions. That was probably ironic, but she says, I do not suggest they do that. Because if they do that now, they're not going to have a career. They'll never be professors at any university in Norway, for example. And, 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 and I was together with her in that situation because I also wrote about those issues. Be careful who we trust. But if this is the situation for, for, for professors and academics, I mean, what degree of freedom is there in the West? Totally spot on. It's, um, and, and this is also, you know, when we talk about what people can believe and what, uh, to what degree journalists uh, know actually what is happening. Uh, when the uh, academic uh, world uh, totally betrays standing up for what is true, where can they go and say, well, is this professor actually said this and this professor actually says that? Never. I see, you know, on a daily basis, we have, at least in, in Danish television, we have academics who are only, you know, running with the American version, propaganda version of what's happening in Libya, Yugoslavia, North Korea and, and Syria. So there, there are no intellectual background to support critical thinking. It's, it's, it's demolished. And of course, uh, uh, we could uh, easily blame the academics uh, but as you say, it's of course very dangerous just to begin to be curious whether there is a, a, a completely different version of reality. So they're not going there. We've had leading academics in this country who after writing one column or one commentary, two commentaries, have been told, called into the office and bluntly been told, we've noticed that you've written an article. If you write one more, you can forget your career here. Mm. And if, in this case, this was a young, aspiring, excellent, uh, uh, one of the brightest minds in Norway, 
he continued writing articles and he never got that job. Yeah. And they made sure he, you know, I mean, the things that was done to him, you know, it's like the scary horror movies and the evil that's spoken about people, the stigmatization, the belittling, you know, that it's like the mob in Rome yeah. coming to attack you. And the I mean, it's just unbelievable how uncivilized, how illiberal, how intolerant mm. that type of leftism, or you might say, if that's being progressive, then we're not progressive anymore, but we've reintroduced a new form of pro progressivism, which is an illiberal authoritarianism in that case. It's horrible. Yeah, but yeah, it is. And uh, I, I mean, killing critical thinking was one of the main issues for neoliberalism to take uh, power completely, right? So you had the up uh, in, in the 80s and especially perhaps the 90s, uh, Karl Marx, uh, you know, all kind of socialist thinking was really uh, ridiculed completely in, in the media, the wall fall, uh, fell. And uh, so critical thinking went out from the, from the newspapers and the uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, most, if not all, uh, journalists today, editors, uh, are more or less right-wing. Uh, so they like, uh, you know, uh, at least they they like the globalist again agenda, and uh, and 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 they simply buy what comes from America as as good. So okay, there might be a critical, but it's absurd. You sit here and say that Assad is the victim, and this is absurd compared to everything we hear. Uh, in, from all kinds of sources, so yeah. so we are drowning. Uh, critical thinking is drowning, and uh, and of course it's 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 somewhat totalitarian what is happening because the academics, uh, the, the few critical minds, uh, of course they sense what is happening. So either if they cross the border, they uh, they are attacked, and the rest of them, okay, I'm not going there. So it's a culture of fear and it's a culture of lack of freedom. Yeah, but we and have... It's a culture of, of freedom being defined as the right to agree yeah. to the uh, politically correct um, uh, narrative. And on that note, I would like to thank you, uh, sociologist and uh, journalist Lars Jorgensen, for taking the time to come to the Halland Report. Thank you very much for your research and good luck in your work. It's, a, it's been a pleasure.